Thank you very much, Andy. I cannot imagine my being more pleased or more impressed with the quality of the lectures this day, along with the presentations of them, nor could I imagine being more happy to be a part of this gathering. We appreciate so very much the presence of every person who is here today, and we are grateful that you have taken time out of your busy lives to be a part of this lectureship and to hear the preaching of the Word of God. And so we are grateful for every precious soul that is gathered here today. On the very night that our Lord was betrayed, we find that he was in that upper room with his disciples. The Bible tells us that after supper, he took that unleavened bread and that fruit of the vine and gave it to those disciples that they might partake. And in so doing, he instituted what we now know of as the Lord's Supper. This marked the end of that Jewish feast of the Passover being fulfilled by Christ, who is our Passover, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. And at the conclusion of that meal, Jesus instituted that memorial feast, which would now and ultimately be observed in his kingdom. In Matthew chapter 26 and in verse 29, Jesus would say, But I say unto you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. We see that Jesus gave that memorial feast, that unleavened bread, that fruit of the vine, that would be observed by his disciples with him in his kingdom. As we go to the book of Acts, chapter 2, we find that on that occasion, on that day of Pentecost, the church was established. The kingdom began. And at the beginning of the church, the disciples began to observe the Lord's Supper as a part of their worship to God. And in Acts chapter 2 and in verse 42, the Bible tells us that those first Christians continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine in the fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. We see that as the church began, that members of the body of Christ observed the Lord's Supper from its very beginning. All three of the synoptic writers give us an account of the institution of the Lord's Supper. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record for us that Jesus instituted that memorial feast. Sadly, only a short time after its beginning, Abuses of that sacred feast began to surface. And we see that there were those that began to, to observe the Lord's Supper in ways in which God, God had not originally intended. The church at Corinth was certainly guilty of such abuses. If you would like to open up your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we see that today we have been assigned, verses 17 through 34, is a passage under uh, our consideration as we think about uh, the Lord's Supper. We see that in the Apostle Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, he addressed those issues whereby they were corrupting the Lord's Supper. We see that he endeavored to help them to have a better understanding as well as to correct the abuses that were present there. And we see that in our examination of this passage, we will endeavor to arrive at a proper understanding of Paul's intended message to the Corinthian church, while at the same time, we will endeavor to glean from this text those things that perhaps could make an oppression upon us and how that we might be better prepared to observe the Lord's Supper in a way that would be more pleasing to God and more meaningful to us. And as we direct our attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, today we will endeavor to take a look at this passage in three ways. We will divide this into three sections. The first of which, we will notice first of all, that Paul points out that in the Corinthian church there were divisions that were corrupting the Lord's Supper in verses 17 through 22. In the second place, 
Paul then will go on to deliver to them the doctrine that the Lord gave concerning a proper observance of the Lord's Supper in verses 23 through 26. And then in the third place, in verses 27 through 34, we see that Paul will give them some directions in an effort to correct the abuses of the Lord's Supper that were present in Corinth. And now as we take a look at this text, let us notice first of all that there were divisions that were in the church at Corinth that was corrupting their observance of the Lord's Supper. And in verse 17, we see that Paul says, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. And so the church at Corinth had been plagued by those who were causing divisions, they were causing factions in the body of Christ. Now back in chapter 1, we find that Paul began his writing to the church at Corinth. In chapter 1, he got right to the point, talking about these divisions that were among them. And what did he say to them? In verse number 10, he said, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. As brother... Brad Poe pointed out to us this morning that division in the body of Christ is certainly a foundational issue. Paul got right to the heart of the matter and seemingly all of the problems that they had in Corinth were probably stemming from the fact that they were not in agreement with one another. They were being plagued by divisions and factions among them. And now here in chapter 11 Paul reveals that there were divisions that were springing out of their disrespect for the Lord's Supper. How is it that you can come together and be divisive? How is it that you can come together and be challenged, not uh, in the area of love and those kinds of things, and then gather around the Lord's table and partake of that memorial feast in a pleasing and positive way? I submit to you that it just can't be done. And so Paul deals, first of all, with the fact that there were divisions among them. Now, there are two things here that I'd like for us to notice. When we think about the fact that divisions existed among them, let us notice, first of all, that divisions are shameful. Isn't that what Paul is saying? Here in verse 17, he says, In giving these instructions, I do not praise you. I do not praise you. You see, Paul shows a definite change in tone here than he did back in verse 2. In chapter 11 here, look back at verse 2. Paul says, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, that the head of woman is man, and that the head of Christ is God. And that is... Uh, uh, the wrong verse. That's verse 3. He says now, in verse 2, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions as I delivered you. What did he say? Now I praise you. He began by saying, here is an area where I can praise you. But now the tone has changed. And he says, here, I'm not praising you. And so we see that as he addresses the fact that there were divisions among them, he says, I do not praise you. Why? Because divisions are shameful. This praise quickly turned into criticism and shame in regard to their church assemblies. We see that as difficult as it is to imagine, their worship services were more harmful than they were beneficial. He says, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Now imagine, if you will, Sunday morning comes. You perhaps aren't feeling well. Maybe you've had a rough night. Maybe you've got a headache. Maybe you have thoughts in your mind that maybe you just don't really feel well enough to, to, to assemble with the saints today. But then you decide, well, I'm going to go anyway. And so you go. And you get there and you worship God. And then afterwards, as you're leaving, the thought enters your mind... I'm really glad that I came today. I feel much better now. We've all been there, haven't we? 
Maybe in the beginning we didn't feel that well. But after having assembled with God's people, having had the opportunity to lift up our hearts and our voices in song and in praise to God and enjoying the wonderful fellowship with one another, we leave energized, we leave renewed, we, re we leave in a much better condition than when we came. And we feel better about it. I'm so glad that I was here today. And we benefit greatly from it. But now imagine, if you would, coming together and leaving, saying, I wish I'd never come. Paul says, I do not praise you because of your divisions. You're coming together not for the better, but for the worse. Can you imagine people coming together to worship God and not being better off because of it? Brother Wendell Winkler made this observation. He says, there was a problem in Corinth concerning the Lord's Supper. This problem grew out of the Corinthian brethren engaging in their love feasts and integrating and mixing the same with the Lord's Supper. Accordingly, in eating a common meal, some had more than others, eating at the same, uh, eating the same before the others. They became filled while others were hungry. And so what was happening here? It seems as though that they were, as they commonly did, partake of a meal together when they came together. They had a fellowship meal. They had a, a, a love feast, if you will. And it seems as though that out of that, there were some cor corruptions that were associated with that. Because of their divisions, they were sectarianized into little groups. And so uh, some would come in and perhaps... Uh, be not Christian and loving about it and they would jump before others and they would eat to the fill and not leaving perhaps enough for others. And so those who probably needed the least got the most and those who needed the most maybe not, didn't get any. And ultimately that attitude and those abuses spilled over into their observance of the Lord's Supper. So not only was this a selfish disregard for brethren, it was a corruption of the Lord's Supper. And Paul says, in this, I cannot praise you. As a matter of fact, what he seemed to be saying is, I am ashamed of you. This is a, sin, uh, this is a shameful thing. No wonder Paul was prompted to say in verse 22, What? Do you not have houses? to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? And then he says, I do not praise you. Paul could not praise them because their actions were divisive and they were shameful. But not only do we notice that their actions and their divisions were shameful, let us notice in the second place that their divisions were sinful as well. And he points that out in verses 18 through 21. We see here that from this context, we learn that divisions are sinful for at least three reasons. Let us notice, first of all, that these divisions were sinful because they were condemned by the Lord. Our Lord never wanted division among his disciples. In his last hours upon this earth, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, as he was prostrate in the garden and he was deep in prayer to his Father in heaven, you'll recall in verse 21 of John chapter 17, he prayed that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they all may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. What did Jesus pray for? He was praying for his disciples and the number one thing on his mind concerning them was that they would be together, that they would be united together, that they would be one. Jesus never wanted there to be division among his people. But then we notice that furthermore that an attitude of division was not to be tolerated in the church. You remember what the Apostle Paul said when he wrote to the church at Rome, in Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. He said, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. And to the Corinthians, we see that Paul emphasized 
unity among them, and he condemned division among them. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. He said, let there be no divisions among you. And so we see that these divisions are condemned by the Lord. In the second place, we see that division is sinful because it causes contention among the Lord's people. In verses 18 and 19 of 1 Corinthians 11, Paul said, for first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Paul had been hearing some reports. As had been noted earlier, he had heard some things from the household of Chloe. He had been hearing some things through the grapevine. He had heard that there was some division among them, and he really did not want to believe it, but he believed that there must be something to it. And even though there was strife among them, there were faithful brethren that could be recognized as they contended for the right. He says that there were among them, even though there were divisions, even though there were those that were causing great factions, he says there were those among them who were approved. I told Brother Gary Hampton a while ago, I quoted him, so let me give you this quote from Brother Hampton. He says, divisions caused by carnal thinking tend to separate those who are striving to meet God's standards, 2 Timothy 2.15, from those who are not. The approved, Paul mentioned, would be those who like metal pass the test and prove to be genuine. Brother Wayne Jackson added to that this observation. While heretical schisms are most unfortunate, at least one advantage results. Those approved of God are manifest. That is, they are apparent. And then he says, the cream does rise to the top. And so Paul seems to be saying here that even, they, there, even though there are all these circumstances that exist in the church at Corinth, all of these terrible things, yet there is something to be thankful for, and that is that there are faithful brethren there that are given an opportunity to shine. They're given the opportunity to stand up for that which is right. But then thirdly, let us notice that divisions are sinful because they corrupt the Lord's Supper. They produce corruptions to the Lord's Supper. When divisions are present, problems will abound. And here in verses 20 and 21, we find that there are two problems that are the direct result of divisions. Let us notice that first of all, we find here that there was a problem with their coming together. Look at verse 20. He says, therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. When you come together. Now, imagine how difficult it is for the Lord's church to come together when there is a problem with division. When we find that there are those that are maybe bickering, we find that there are those that are not getting along in the church, that creates a great strain on everything any congregation of the Lord's people. And he says here that there's a problem with their coming together. Imagine, if you will, a family. And you know, it's just one of those days. You know, you've had one of those days in your family, haven't you? And just think for a moment that there's this family, and you know there's one of those days when everybody's just in a bad mood. And it just seems like nothing's going right, and there, there, there continues to be these clashes in, in the family and in the home. The children are bickering, and the children are fighting, and sooner or later, you know, it works on mom and dad's nerves, and now they're at one another. And, you know, just every time we turn around, there's one of these. But then mealtime comes. No matter how mad you might be, and no matter how much you're not getting along, you know, hunger helps us with a lot of things, doesn't it? And so mealtime comes, and the dinner's on the table, and everybody gathers around and sits down. And we're just silent. Nobody's saying anything. Finally, someone says, okay, I'll pray. And it's kind of hard to pray, isn't it? We fought all day, and now we're going to pray. I'm not in the mood to pray, but we're going to pray. 
And so we pray. After the prayer, it's still silent. People just start, we start to eat. There's just a little clanging of glasses and silverware and plates. Pass me a roll. You don't want to say that when everybody's mad. You don't have to take one upside the head. <laughs> you know, mealtime is a wonderful time. We emphasize that. That's when we come together and we set all the things aside from our day and we're going to sit around in a fa as a family and we're going to converse and we're going to talk to one another. We'll communicate with one another. It's one of the most precious times in family life, but not today. Why? Because we're just mad at one another. How is it that we can come together as the body of Christ and we not getting along out in the parking lot and we avoid each other in the foyer and we make sure that we sit on opposite sides of the building during the worship service, but then we're going to come and we're going to surround the Lord's table and we're going to partake of the unleavened bread. We're going to partake of the fruit of the vine. We're going to remember the death of our Lord as we commune together and with our Lord, with factions and divisions among us. It just cannot be done. It's a disgrace to think that we could pull that off. And Paul says that's exactly what's happening here. He says, therefore, when you come together in one place, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. Or you might be doing some things, and you may have some emblems out there on the table, and you may be passing some things out. But listen, you're not taking the Lord's Supper. You know, we can come together. Isn't it the case that we can come in a setting like this? And we can attend worship and leave without ever worshiping. We can do that. And Paul seems to be saying, you have come and the Lord's Supper has been available, but you're leaving without ever partaking of the Lord's Supper. You come together in one place and it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. The word therefore that he begins with in verse 20 seems to point back to the divisions and the factions discussed in the two previous verses. And because of their divisions, it was impossible for the Corinthian brethren to come together and to properly partake of the Lord's Supper. But not only was there a problem and with their coming together, but let us notice in the second place that there is a problem with their communing together. In verse 21, he says, For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. And one is hungry... And another is drunk. When the disciples came together to worship, they commonly shared a meal together as well. And there would have been no problem with that were it not for the fact that those who abused that meal and in turn abused the Lord's Supper as well. Let us notice that Brother Wayne Jackson made this comment. He says, in a factious environment, it is not possible to assemble in peace and partake of the communion supper in the tranquil mode that God expects. Selfish ambition and elitism segmented these saints. What should have been a simple memorial service reflecting upon the Savior's death had become a common meal during which social classes had been segregated, resulting in some being left hungry while others were gorged. It was the opposite of the spirit of brotherhood unity. Their assemblies had abandoned the original purpose. So the church at Corinth was obviously very guilty of a very serious offense against the Lord, against his church, and against her worship. But then let us notice in the second place, as we continue on, not only does he point out the divisions that were corrupting the Lord's Supper, but in verses 23 through 26, let us notice the doctrine concerning the Lord's Supper. Now, having condemned their, div their divisive attitudes and practices that had corrupted the Lord's Supper, Paul now reminds them of the doctrine that was to regulate the Lord's Supper. And in so doing, he reminded them of three vital aspects of that doctrine. Here we notice, first of all, that as Paul begins in verse 23, that he reminds them of the origin of that doctrine. In verse 23, Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, 
that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying here that that which I have taught you when I was with you and that which I am writing to you now is not from me. It is from the Lord. I received it from him. Now, Paul was not present in that upper room when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. He was one born out of due season. He was not one of the original 12 apostles. and So he was appointed later. And yet... Paul wants them to understand what he was saying to them. He didn't receive it from Peter or the other apostles. It's not something that he just learned along the way as he became a member of the body of Christ. He says, that which I've given to you, I have received from the Lord. As Brother Conley pointed out just a little while ago, that when Paul spoke, and when he wrote, he was writing by inspiration. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And here Paul was writing to them by inspiration. And what Paul had received from the Lord, he had taught to the church at Corinth, and he is now delivering to them in written form. And it would be their obligation to abide in it. It would be their obligation to take it and to use this as the law as the doctrine by which they would observe the Lord's Supper. Just like those folks in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2 and in verse 42, as they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then let us notice secondly, that not only do we notice the origin of the doctrine, but let us notice the observance of the doctrine in verses 24 and 25. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he not only gave them the doctrine for it, but he also gave them a demonstration of it. Verses 24 and 25, we can learn three keys here, three key points for proper observance of the doctrine that is to govern the Lord's Supper. Let us notice, first of all, the Lord's blessing. In verse number 24, the Bible says, And when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me now notice if you will that both Matthew and Mark state that Jesus took bread and blessed it while Luke and Paul say that he gave thanks and what that says to us is, is those two terms are being used interchangeably when Jesus blessed the bread he was giving thanks for the bread This bread would have been the unleavened bread used during the Passover. In the second place, not only do we notice here the Lord's blessing, but we notice here the Lord's body. Because Jesus, the Bible says, took bread and he broke it. He took bread and broke it and he said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of of me. Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And what did he say? He said, this is my body which is broken for you. This is my body which was broken for you. I don't know what you think about when you partake of the Lord's Supper, and specifically when you break bread. When you take of that unleavened bread, what is it that you think of? What is it that your understanding of that is? Jesus here wanted us to remember what that bread represents. It's not the literal body and blood of Christ, but it does represent his body. And notice he says, This is my body which is broken for you. We must understand that there is tremendous significance in that. Jesus' body was broken when he died for you and for me. When he suffered that cruel death upon Calvary's cross, his body was broken for you and for me. We understand very clearly that his bones were not broken in fulfillment of that prophecy. But yet let us never forget that when he died, his body was broken for you and for me. 
And I submit to you when they placed that crown of thorns upon our Savior's head and they slapped it with that reed that as those thorns penetrated his precious skull, that his body was broken for us. When he was stretched out and whipped and scourged mercilessly with stripe after stripe upon his back, until his back turned to redness. And then it was, began to be shredded by that scourge. But I submit to you that our Lord's body was broken for us. When Jesus was made to lay upon that cruel cross. And those nails were driven through his hands. And through his feet. His body was broken for us. And when that Roman soldier thrust that spear into our Lord's side, and with that gaping hole from which that blood mingled with water emerged, I submit to you that our Lord's body was broken. Jesus' body was broken for us when he gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us. Galatians 1 and verse 4. Jesus' body was broken for us when he gave himself a ransom for us. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 6. Jesus' body was broken for us when he gave himself for us that he might redeem us. Titus 2, 14 and 15. And consequently from that, here's what we may recall. That to partake of the Lord's Supper is to emphasize when we think of Jesus as one whose body was broken for us, that we remember and to emphasize him as our rescue. We remember him as our ransom, and we remember him as our redemption, knowing that each was made possible because Jesus Christ himself gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God, Ephesians 5 and verse 2. Listen, when we partake, of that unleavened bread, let us never forget Jesus' body, which was broken. It wasn't just broken. It was broken for me. And he saved my soul from sin and the eternal consequences thereof because his body was broken for me. When Jesus said that that bread is my body, he was using a metaphor, and yet from that we understand that he wants us to understand and to know that he did it for us. But then not only that, let us notice in the next place that we see the Lord's blood. And in verse number 25, the Bible says, In the same manner he also took the cup of the su after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In drinking of the fruit of the vine, one should do so remembering the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Remembering that not only was his body broken for us, but from those gaping wounds came his blood. When he gave his life, the Bible says that the life is in the blood and in the shedding of his blood, he gave that which can cleanse my soul. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You see, Jesus died. But he didn't just die. He gave his blood. He shed his blood. He was willing to give every single drop of it for you and for me and for the cleansing of our sins. Let us notice in the third place the ordinance of the doctrine. As we go to verse 26, the Bible says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And having provided the particulars for observance, Paul now gives the accompanying ordinance or law concerning the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. And that ordinance consists of three parts. First of all, let us notice that he begins with the perpetuating of the Lord's Supper, and that it is to be perpetuated. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death till he come. You know, in some places, that's not very often, is it? For as often as you eat this bread, and some places, not very often. 
Isn't it sad that some places they want to take the Lord's table instead of having it front and center as we have it here today, they want to shove it over there in a the dark corner somewhere. We'll just observe this now and then. We'll observe this annually. We'll observe this quarterly. We'll, we'll save it to some special occasion. Really? Really? Jesus said, for as often, or Paul said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. The Lord's Supper was given as a weekly observance that we might always remember Jesus' death. Well, for time's sake, I need to keep on going here. If my clicker will work. I think my battery's going dead. Nope, I think it went dead. So someone needs to move the clicker for me up there. If there's somebody up there, hit it. And keep on hitting it, because we got to go. Okay? <laughs> All right, in the second place, we notice him proclaiming the Lord's death. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15, if you will, when the Apostle Paul there uh, was talking about what he had preached to them. Verses uh, uh, 3 and 4, he says, I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he arose again the third day according to the scriptures. What is it that Paul was preaching to them? He was preaching Christ, and he was preaching the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, and that is the gospel of Christ. Paul stated that in partaking the Lord's, uh, Lord's Supper, you proclaim the Lord's death. And so you might say, well, I'm not a preacher, I'm not a teacher, but yet Paul is making the point that every time that we come around this table, every time we partake of these sacred emblems, we are acknowledging and proclaiming the Lord's death. We are proclaiming that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We are proclaiming that we believe that he suffered and that he died, he was buried, and he arose from the tomb. But then in the next place, let us notice thirdly, the promise of the Lord's coming. The observance of the Lord's Supper is to continue till he comes. You do proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And so with our minds squarely focused on the body and the blood of Jesus who died for us, Paul now brings into view the resurrection of Christ with the promise of his future return. Hodge said of this, it is a commemoration. Go ahead and click it. Hit it. Please. There you go. It is a commemoration of his death, for it is in its very nature a proclamation of that great fact. It was not a temporary institution, but one designed to continue until the consummation, as the Passover was a perpetual commemoration of the deliverance of, uh, out of Egypt and prediction of the coming and death of the Lamb of God, who was to bear the sins of the world, so the Lord's Supper is at once the commemoration of the death of Christ and a pledge of his coming, the second time without sin unto salvation. This memorial feast will continue. It will be perpetuated until the Lord's come, the Lord comes. Now I've got about four minutes, and I've got a whole third point to go. So I'm just going to have to hit the highlights here. So just keep up with me up there. The beloved apostle had condemned their divisions, which had corrupted the Lord's Supper, and he reminded them of the doctrine concerning the Lord's Supper. And now he provides them with some directions intended to correct their abuses of the Lord's Supper. And so here in verses 27 through 34, he gives them some directions to help them correct the abuses of the Lord's Supper that they were guilty of. The first thing he says is you need to partake in a worthy manner. Verse 27, notice that he says there, um, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Invariably, we've all heard someone say, I just couldn't take the Lord's Supper. I just didn't feel worthy to do that. Well, that's not what Paul says. That's a gross misunderstanding of this passage. If we're going to come down to only worthy people or people who are worthy of the Lord's Supper partaking of it, none of us are going to meet that. None of us are going to be able to do that. But he doesn't say you have to be worthy to partake of it. He says you need to partake of it in a worthy manner, something that the Corinthian brethren were not doing. Here Paul points out clearly that it's possible to commune in an unworthy manner way. 
and there are consequences for so doing. In the second place, verses 28 and 29, he tells them they need to practice self-discipline. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink that cup, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So he says, you need to examine yourself. Take a look at what you're doing, and in order to avoid partaking in an unworthy way, he instructs them to give a proper examination of self. I don't know about you, but I'd rather examine you. I'd rather examine you rather than self, wouldn't you? It's much easier to see what the other guy's doing than it is to see what we're doing. Paul says you need to examine yourself and whether or not you're partaking in a worthy manner. In third place, in verse 30, he says you need to do these things that you might pre prevent spiritual illness. For this reason, many are weak, many are sick among you, and many sleep. Failure to examine self and partake of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner will result in a spiritual decline, spiritual disease, and spiritual death. And then, fourthly, he says, you need to prepare for the Lord's discipline. In verse 31, he says, if we would judge ourselves we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. If we're not careful, we're not examining ourselves properly, if we're not noticing uh, very carefully the Lord's doctrine concerning the Lord's Supper and other things as well, we will partake in an unworthy manner. Tis set the feast divine, the bread, the fruit of the vine, and saints commune before the shrine in the supper of the Lord. Thank you. And thank you, Terry. It was another marvelous lesson on that communion which binds us together. We are sorry for the technical difficulties.